together, we'll explore the challenges and possibilities of renewing our sense of place and work in the world by re-examining sure anchors and safe harbors. She's a professor and novelist who writes under the name M. Dressler and is the author of seven books, one of which I have up here, the latest, I guess. A graduate of Rice University, she knows the area well here. Her work has been recognized by the Texas Institute of Letters and with grants and awards from the Paisano Fellowship, the Fulbright Commission, the Carson McCullers Center, and others. Her award-winning novel sequence, The Last Ghost Series, is being developed for the screen by director Livia De Paolis. A former resident of Galveston, she now divides her time between Oregon and Utah. I'm delighted to welcome back Melanne Dressler, who will speak on faith, fluidity, and the fine art of floating. <laughs> get situated here. Good morning. How wonderful it is to be back with you. I, some of you may not know this, but this is my third or fourth time, I think, speaking here at the U. And uh, every time it's such a delight. Um, I don't live in Galveston anymore, but I did for a number of years in the 90s and early in this millennium. And then I went on to other things. But I, when I have a book tour, which I have right now, I swing. I always swing through Texas. And I reach out to Margaret Canavan, and I say, hmm. I'm, yes, I'm coming to Texas. And then I just sort of pause <laughs> and hope that she will extend a, a wonderful invitation. And she did, and you all did. And I'm so delighted to be back with you. It's such an honor. Every time I come, I try to write something special just for you all, um, something that I create just for this occasion. Um, and so today I'm going to read a little something I wrote indeed on the art of floating, uh, something very personal that I also hope will resonate with you. Thank you so much again. Again, um, for allowing me to, to spend some time uh, with you this morning. So on the art of floating. Several years ago, my friends, I tried surfing for the first time. It was both daunting and magical, that feeling of trying to stand on a moving, rushing bridge that might sustain you or might simply and noisily crush you. I never forgot the experience of North Carolina's roiling Atlantic. I was afraid of the surf, truth to tell, but also curious. But I lived far from the coast and had no time and maybe really not as much inclination or need as I thought to learn to float above a surging current. I had a new book to be released. I was a professor with courses to teach. I was in the process of trying to help my parents move across the country to the home they had bought for their retirement. Floating was not on my calendar. <laughs> then the pandemic hit. It rolled us, didn't it? It stunned us. It smashed us. We began to see our former lives evaporate. Within days, my college would close its doors to in-person classes. My book tour was canceled. Meanwhile, my aging parents were stranded on the Oregon coast, alone, terrified, in a new and unfamiliar setting. 48 hours before much of the country shut down. Do you guys remember that, how it was just sort of the pandemic was abstract, and then all of a sudden it just went whoosh? And we started to hear lockdown, shutdown. 48 hours before that happened, I packed my bags, got on a plane, and took a flight from east to west, passing over 3,000 miles of dry land, floating above what was happening down there. What was happening down there? The freeways were empty. My parents had purchased a duplex so that I would have a place to stay in the future when they needed care. We had arranged all this optimistically, somewhat casually, thinking there would be plenty of time now it seemed ridiculously prescient, almost ugly, like planning on a plane crash. We hunkered down. The view from my windows was of the heaving Pacific, not unfamiliar, but not the same ocean I'd swum in North Carolina. The Oregon coast, my friends, is cold. The water hovers consistently around 49 degrees. 
It's not as rainy as people imagine. It is incredibly beautiful and peaceful, and it has few people. How ideal for a pandemic. A lot of them older and safety conscious. The state implemented shutdowns and mask mandates quickly. The death rate, mercifully, would be and still is one of the lowest in the country. The vaccines, when they finally came, would be fairly easy to access. But we didn't know any of that in the spring of 2020. We were scared, like almost everyone else, and cut off, suspended. I found I couldn't write. I write about ghosts in my books. But how could I write about ghosts and surviving past death when the refrigerated trucks were bluntly parked, lacking in all imagination, all sense of movement and hope? Of course, there was a few weeks there, and it seems quaint to think about it now. There was that period of strange, playful joy that took over and united so many people who were separated from each other, but determined not to lose connection and hope. Do you all remember that, kind of the early weeks and months? There was almost this giddy joy, you know? The actors in their, stuck in their New York loft apartments, right, were reading to us, right? And the ballet dancers were out in the streets performing solos and filming them, and the music, Yo-Yo Ma, you know, was playing the cello for us. There was that period of almost giddy enthusiasm as people gathered online and sang and read and tried to buoy us and themselves. It was lovely. Some writers read their work online or gave workshops from their homes. I didn't. My job was to watch over my parents to force my mother to stand back from a rare visitor to her door, someone who wanted to bring lunch one day. My mother loves to touch people, embrace them if possible. I stood at her shoulder and exhaled on her like a refrigerated truck. No, Mom! No! No! Perhaps you were or are like me. I found I could do whatever needed to be done but nothing more. Do you all remember that? Like you could just do what needed to be done, right? But nothing more. Since I couldn't be around people, I needed to go out to the big, wide Oregon beaches. I stared at the water. People were starting to do more things outdoors because it was safer. There were reports of the national parks being overrun. There were discarded masks on the sand. But out there in front of me was the blank, wrinkled ocean. I consulted with the beloved friend thousands of miles away who had taken me surfing in North Carolina that first time. On her advice, I bought a wetsuit against the cold and a big beginner's board. My editor, meanwhile, contacted me. Where was my next book? Where was the next ghost story? I had assumed the pandemic had so tanked book sales there was a chance I would never be able to write anything again. I said there was no next book and I was going outside. Now here's the thing about ghosts, or at least ghosts as I see them. Their preeminent talent is floating. They hover, neither one thing nor the other, neither living nor dead, neither body nor mere ether. Months later, when I was finally able to ride again, and my ghosts, with their special combination of wisdom and bravura and confusion and hunger, came back to me, resurrecting themselves, this is what one whispered. Her name is Emma Rose Finnis. She drowned in 1915, and she narrates all of my stories. Emma says this. The world imagines we're simply soul and body, spirit and flesh, one of them meaningless without the other, as though we couldn't be something else entirely besides, something there's no word for. So we settle for soul and body. But here I am, something else, something besides, and so are you. I grew up by the sea. The cliff stood high above the ocean and all its spray and foam. There's a headland there covered in mustard seed and sea thrift blossoms. It's damp nearly all the year round. Wow, here too. And salty always. And the ground smells of air. And the air smells of ground. Not one thing or the other. The fog comes in, and it's neither cloud nor rain. The tide comes in and goes out and comes back again. There's no one level to the water. Some high tides are higher than others. Some lows are lower, and that's the way of things. 
The sea was there, and it's also here in me now. And I don't mean just as a memory. I mean something else besides. There's the sea, and there's me, and there's the place where me and the sea meet, and it's as real as anything you can touch, and maybe more, because it lasts and can travel farther. The trouble is that most of us aren't ghosts and aren't good at floating and traveling in this way, traveling away from what we think of as ourselves and our lives. Floating is not our natural posture. We are expected, my friends, to anchor. Those who float are often criticized and even feared, sometimes mocked. You must be here or there. You must be one thing or another. Floating is not life. You must decide. Catch yourself floating and unsure, and you will often be deeply unsettled. You must be clear, we are taught. You are east or west. You are this or that. Perhaps because I'm a writer, people will sometimes contact me with questions about language, dreads, really, along with hopes that I might pin a few things down. They want to know, for example, what gender fluid means. They want to know why people have different pronouns now, not just he and she, but they. And what is hers, H-I-R-Z, and how can you be more than one gender? I see them asking, floating, almost afraid, the world no longer a solid substance they recognize. I spoke with friends during the pandemic who described what soon became the familiar sensation of not knowing what time it was, and along with that, the strange sensation of not inhabiting your body in the same, some people are nodding here, do you remember that? Not inhabiting your body in the same way. As if by not being able to touch other bodies, the neighbor who brought food to my mother's door, we lost the edges of our own. Friends told me, they felt disembodied. It was hard to imagine the hundreds of thousands of bodies in the trucks and in the graves. Hospital staff described patients who did not seem to understand that something can be invisible but real, attack the body, and change it into something else, meat, ash. The virus clogged our lungs, making it impossible to breathe. Too many bodies and the hospital staff started quitting, their own bodies and minds unable to stay afloat. Who can blame them? Neither, I'm sorry, neither could many businesses stay afloat, and relationships, things just beginning or things that had long been in place, friends told me they felt lost. But others reveled, though they were at first shy to admit it in the isolation. They reveled in being untethered. The anchor was never all that great to begin with, they said. The expectation that all we should ever do is stop and then climb, climb, climb. How about you, they asked. You're a writer. You must be getting a lot of interesting writing done. All that space and time. I wasn't. I was surfing. The nice thing about a wetsuit is that it defines you. If you are feeling flabby and ill-conceived and lazy and uncertain, it is a corset of neoprene. You are sucked tightly into shape. You are an outline all in black. You become clear. You kind of look like a superhero, actually. Better yet, instead of being cold, you are warm. The thickness of material gives you a little buoyancy. Every time I put a wetsuit on, and it isn't easy, by the way, it's like trying to fit yourself into four straws, I feel compressed, like a deviously executed poem, like Adrian Rich's famous poem, Diving into the Wreck, where she walks around in rubber booty scuba diving. In spite of all this, I can't say I took up surfing simply in response to the floating of the pandemic. Not exactly. I took it up and have been trying to learn how to stand up on water because every day the ocean is right there in front of me. That and the fact that it cares nothing about me, it expects nothing of me, it is exquisitely not me. It both stares me in the face and ignores me, I was already floating in the miasma of the pandemic. I had no idea if that experience of being neither here nor there would help me ride something as ephemeral as a wave, or if the waves would help me cope with the pandemic. I didn't turn to the waves to cope, or at least not only to cope. I turned, I came back to them, because I remembered the first time I rode a wave, not even standing all the way up, but on, I have to tell you guys, please don't imagine that I'm a good surfer. <laughs> not a good surfer, all right? 
But the first time, not even standing all the way up, but on one knee, I was floating and flying all at once. It was surrendering, but not every bit of yourself. I started going out almost every day in all kinds of weather to the beach not far from my parents' house. I went out in any kind of water, the kind experienced servers wouldn't bother with, because I was a beginner, and that meant I wasn't really riding waves, but rather the white water as it came gurgling or crashing into shore, sometimes reforming into smaller waves that I could catch with my big, buoyant, foam-filled, boat-like beginner board. Yeah, don't imagine me on anything cool, okay? Nothing. No. I found I was smiling nearly all the time, floating. I didn't know I could smile that much. It felt good. It actually felt good to be so inexpert, overpowered, even much of the time unable to stand or stand for long, unfamiliar with the motions around and underneath me, and at risk too, my friends, not safe. I had to accept that surfing could hurt me, even drown me in the way it had my character Emma, the ghost who had spoken to me so blithely about being not one thing or another, neither water nor air. It felt good that there would and could be no triumphing over the waves. Never. Even experienced surfers will tell you this, because the ocean is in charge, not you. The waves come and come, and they are largely unpredictable, and though you can learn to read them and do what you can to protect yourself, a wetsuit for warmth, a leash that ties you to the buoy of your board, still you can never be entirely certain what will happen, and so you must adjust to that. You will have no control, but neither will you be entirely ignorant. Not anymore. I had been surfing for six months when my editor asked again, where is the next book? It was the end of the first year of the pandemic. Long gone was that fleeting sense of unity, the faces on the internet singing songs and teaching us how to crochet. We had settled into camps of the masked and unmasked, people who were afraid to go out and people who punched strangers when they did. Vaccines had not yet arrived, but new variants had or were about to. Wave after wave, how many would there be? I sat down at my computer again and the ghost started talking how intimate they had become. I seemed to know them better now, share their hovering. I wrote faster than I had ever written before, an entire book, this one right here, written in three months. Something had shifted. I rode each sentence as it showed up. I looked past it and saw the next line coming, and the next after that. This was something new, this floating, this letting myself move like a practiced spirit now whether she meant to be or not, in hovering in the moment. Who knows what will come next, my friends? Hug your parents close. Bear your arm. This is probably going to sting. You are likely to feel tired afterward, maybe even very tired again. There is no way to know what is coming next, what the next wave will be, will look like. But we know this. The virus is no longer novel, and neither are we. But we have a chance to be novel, perhaps, new, renewed. That's the meaning of novel, of course. Those of us who were lucky enough to make it through this thing so far. To live lives that are less about start here, now climb, 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 so that you're always bound to fall. And more about balance, which is another word for floating. When you float, there is equal ballast between you and the world. You are present, riding each moment, which you always were, if before now it was masked, hidden from you. My wish for you, for us, is that we do not imagine we are now triumphing over what has happened to us. It is not at all clear yet that we have. My hope is that we will not forget the very solid things we may have learned while floating, about floating, and embrace the fluid itself as real, as love, as the possible, as, as so many world traditions have always already been telling us, as the truth. Thank you.